We're live. Good morning, Japan. I am here with uh, <laughs> with Trevor West. He is uh, well, a guy from the US, uh, <laughs> living <laughs> living in uh, Japan uh, for the last eight months, and mm -hmm. well, more bigger part of his life uh, life. Uh, exploring Japanese culture, language, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I am also kind of of this Eastern culture explorer. Uh, I love uh, samurai <laughs> Zen. And, uh, I <laughs> yeah. guess we both, we both <laughs> listen, obviously, to Alan Watts and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, uh recently Trevor wrote a post I will uh, link it up uh, down the video and uh, he wrote about well not uh, about enlightenment <laughs> <And Yeah. Zen>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, maybe we just start like why did you s what's your beginning with Jap Japan and uh, then we go to Buddhism and Zen so okay. something like that. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Marco, for the, the good intro. Uh, so, so just a very brief intro. I'm Trevor West. I'm currently working and living on Iki Island in Japan. It's like this Japan, uh, you have like the, like the main islands. It's like a banana kind of. And then like all the way down here southwest in Kyushu is where Iki Island is. And I'm working here as the coordinator for international relations, so translation and stuff. Uh, so basically... I guess what started me, <laughs> what what initially got my interest in Japan was uh, like the pop culture was uh, it was anime it was specifically Naruto. <laughs> I remember watching it. At, what was it in middle school? I think I I started to watch anime and other things in Japanese with English subtitles in high school and beyond. But initially, I watched it English dubbed. So. That's how I got an interest in Japanese culture in general, and then it, it branched from there. You know, I was like, oh, I want to learn the language because there was some some video games, some anime. I wanted to visit Japan, so my interest expanded from there. And I guess uh, I don't know if this is, is going to be. I'll, I'll keep it brief, but religiously, <laughs> I was raised in a um, Mormon background. Uh, it's a Christian branch, and so I had my experience in that. I was raised in that, but Basically, I went through like a period of like Mormonism to kind of being angry atheist, to being like atheist, to being agnostic atheist, to being agnostic, to, to not really caring anymore or labeling anymore. And then so in that interest of me kind of learning more about other religions and cultures and Japanese culture specifically, I ran into Zen, Zen Buddhism, just Buddhism in general, Taoism or Taoism, however you want to call it, uh, Hinduism. So in my, I, I researched a lot of, and looked into and read a lot of philosophy, psycho psychology, religion. And so, yeah, that's how I got interested in Zen and why I guess I'm in Japan and stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and uh, how, now that you mentioned an anime, how does that uh, like uh, uh, sort of art reflect from uh, their culture is it like can you read the the, the eastern culture from it i think i, I haven't uh, watched it a lot i know some uh, at least not when i was young now mm -hmm. I, I've, I've seen something with my with my uh, with my daughter some okay. of the not the short animated but with the with the longer ones it's my one okay. was my friend something with the Might fat be... Oh, my neighbor Totoro. It's like yeah, a yeah, Studio yeah, Ghibli. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are really popular. I really like those. Those are, those yeah, are yeah. good movies. <laughs> so and, and and it's uh and I watch then I watch I don't know Disney and then I watch mm. this and it's uh it's completely different. It's oh, so yeah. these ones are so I don't know peaceful. They're they kind of mm. have like a more natural mm. uh, message or something. It's yeah then you you see like okay this is because lots of people i, I think the, they don't even know they live inside a culture oh Would, for I, sure I, yeah <laughs> so so this is actually what it, 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 because i always think about it but now when you really think 
I don't think that people uh, know it. Like for yeah, this is like uh, making me who I am, the culture. Mm. So how does uh, how did that impact your life? Maybe maybe even mm. while in the US learning and now when you're or living there mm. for eight months. Yeah, well, I think definitely in the U.S., anime and exposure to other, mainly Japanese culture, but other cultures too, you know, foods and practices and these things. Uh, specifically, Japanese culture was a big influence for me because I was really interested in it and uh, consumed a lot of it, learned a lot about it. So getting that that gateway into another perspective and it's almost like, it's like reading books and stuff and like being able to jump in someone else's shoes and like try and see things from their perspective and that's where the culture thing comes from, where it's like, for example, just something common, like in Japanese culture, blowing your nose in public is like really rude. So people will like, they'll like sniff all the time and <laughs> probably would drive a lot of Americans really like crazy, <laughs> like just blow your nose, you know, or whatever. But like, it's those little things where you can think that, oh, like these cultural rules and norms and mores that we all just take for granted and say, well, this is right, that's wrong. It's kind of just made up. And when you learn about other cultures, you can come to appreciate this sort of dynamic nature of culture, where it's not like it's not important. It's important. It's what we base our lives on and it's fun and, and, and stuff. But it's also like there's, there's this space that can arise from learning about other cultures. And for me, learning about Japanese culture, or Chinese culture, or other cultures, there's this yeah, greater sense of learning more about American culture, learning more about my own culture, like when I'm here and every day, like when there's a communication error or like I try to say something and maybe I'm like direct translating it from English to Japanese and like, that's just not how you say it. They're like, wait, what? <laughs> and then like, oh, you say it this way. And then it's like, you, you realize that like the way communication works, language works in general is this sort of mutual game of sorts, this mutual uh, dance. So different places have different, sensations different perspectives and different I could say like rhythms because like in japan you could say there's definitely less of an emphasis on the individual it's more like the collective you even see this reflected in the language where people usually don't say i that just gets dropped and it's usually just the verb so instead of saying like hey let's go eat it's just like eat but it's the it's the together sense it's masho yeah. let's do it but there is no let's or or i guess it's let's do it but let's even is like let us do it right yeah, yeah. so it implies a, the pronoun the, the the sense of identity a lot of cases that's dropped which ironically leads to confusion confusion even among japanese people who don't always know what the subject is so when you need to be clear sometimes you will specify the subject because if you don't then you could be referring to like 30 things and in a conversation it could be really clear if you're in the conversation and you're following it. But if you're just hearing from outside, they could be, it could be like anyone. I mean, it happens in English too sometimes, but I'd say it's not as common. It's more common to use I or sort of individual yeah, yeah. focus. No, yeah, it's, it's rare, I would say. Yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting. I, I didn't know that. That's like uh, really influencing you from the beginning you know, in the, on the mm. unconscious level. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. When learning the language, the first, here's like basic Japanese is, so there's like at the end of most polite sentences, there's des, which is like roughly translated in English is it is. So if you're like e des, e is good. So like e des, it is good, good. Uh, but like Yoda speak, it would be like good, it is. And thinking about that way when you're initially learning is really good. Because then you're getting that mindset where a lot of ways things are phrased in Japanese grammatically is backwards compared to English. Uh -huh. And with, with verbs, you don't say, let's, like, I am eating a hamburger. It's, it could be, I hamburger eating. Yeah. <laughs> so the, way that, the, the way the things are, are structured, like, it's like, I hamburger, yeah. I don't know how to phrase that grammatically if it's like subject, object, predicate, or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I yeah. thought they say like good at every, every end of every sentence. Or, oh, 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 you mean like they'll say like e this ne or so this ne, like so this ne. It's like, it's like, oh, yeah, that's totally right. Yeah, that's, that's it. Like in English, you might be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like how, like I say, yeah, they'll be like, hi, hi, hi. 
like yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, then uh, Buddhism. <laughs> oh yeah, And, yeah, Buddhism. That that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's like a Shinto shrine poster right there. Uh, for Kojima Shrine, but that's Shintoism. But we don't have to get into uh, that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I let's say I see it. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. I don't know how. Uh, so how does uh, from I, again? This is culture, so you don't have to enter any. I don't know spirituality or philosophy, but then you do. Obviously, it's because there it's kind of. Well, it's it's different from ours, so I mm. guess it's more obvious to see it, and it's kind of I wouldn't know if it's popular or what, but it's kind of I don't know everybody knows about mm. kung fu and stuff. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. it has like a taste of like you want to know more about it. It, mm. it sounds uh, like it's something different and it's something good. Uh, it was mm. for me. I don't know. It was just attractive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, did you so after anime or stuff like that mm -hmm. did you start uh, uh, what, what what was your uh, what's the difference from reading in the US and uh, mm -hmm. entering immersing into the Japanese culture how did that mm -hmm. influence your I don't know interests and uh, reading and okay. learning about the whole thing yeah I would say Definitely, if you want to learn and, and kind of expand your horizons and stuff, living in another country is probably one of the best ways to do that. Because I had this, I even, I came to this realization because I did a lot of journaling when I was younger. And I came to this realization that I need to stop writing and reflecting. And I just need to go there. I said, <laughs> There's only so far you can get with your books. Um, yeah, yeah. And so this, this is actually a very Zen thing in a lot of ways is that it's, it's okay, stop, stop all this, read, stop it. Just like, like, go, go do it, <laughs> go. <laughs> and uh, so definitely for me coming to Japan, it's like, I just understand on a experience level, a lot of the things that before coming to Japan, I would read and be like, but why, why is it like this? What? This is stupid. Why? And then like you, like I came here, I'm like, oh, that's why. But like, it's not something you can put in words. Like, for example, like Japan religiously a lot of people have this misconception Japan is very atheistic. In some sense it is because the, the rubric most Western countries judge a religious country or not is, do you believe in God? Well, that's a very like monotheistic, Abrahamic Christian, you know, Abrahamic religion paradigm where there is one God. In Japan, there are gods everywhere. There are gods in the trees. There are gods in the bushes, in the ground, in the ocean, in, in the fish. Uh, you know and they have these shinto shrines everywhere and then there's also buddhism there's this interesting mix and i would say that most people aren't super devout and you know maybe the sense like a christian would be like oh i know god exists sort of thing maybe not like that but it gets to this sort of like there's a vagueness in japan in japanese where it, it's interesting i would say though like the general religious sensation or phenomenon in japan is more like uh what do you call it ritualistic so ritual as in you know you say certain, yeah like you say certain things in the morning like you say certain phrases when you finish work you say certain phrases uh in emails you use certain things with certain people and certain social status or whatever you'll use san or maybe people who are equal to you you'll say kun at the end of their name instead of san with customers and people you're really polite to sama like like trevor 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 son you know whatever if, if someone's yeah. being polite towards me and people it, like if i'm talking to someone else i will lower myself in the language so i would never say trevor son someone else would call me that but i would never call myself that because that's elevating myself so in japanese you will lower yourself in the language social status of like language and you will elevate the person you're talking to that's pretty much a general rule in every situation Uh, there's probably exceptions, but that that is the like that, that's the religious spirit of Japan is that ritual aspect that is like ingrained in the culture and language, and then 
Buddhism and Shintoism is like the outlet for more esoteric, mystical, religious experiences. And for the people in Japan who, you know, like people who have an outlet for exploring like a more deeper understanding of religion and spirituality. That's the sense I get. For most people, it's like like most Christians aren't super devout and they're like, I'm going to I'm going to go be a priest or something. It's kind of like that, yeah. maybe. Like most people are like, oh, dude, of course, there's like like spirits and stuff like what are you talking about? But it's not like, it's not like a big deal. You know, it's not like, that's why when like a Westerner comes to Japan and they're interviewing, like, do you believe in God? And they have like their mic and it's like, what are you talking about, dude? Like, like what? what? It's like, it's like if people came to Japan and it's like, do you believe in gods everywhere in the trees? It's like, who would just look at you really weird? Like, so there's this cultural gap where like people are, yeah. in that, like what you're saying before, are so ingrained in their cultural bubble they don't even realize they're in a bubble. So they can't even like think that, oh, like there's people out there who literally don't even really have a good concept of like this monotheism thing because it's not really a part of their culture and never really historically was. <laughs> so they are, they are actually pretty humble, uh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. For, like uh, from a perspective of the whole nation, I think. Mm, and it's, yeah, and it's, I would say... Yeah, Shinto Buddhism doesn't really preach. It's not really proselytizing. Maybe Buddhism a bit. Uh, Shintoism, no. Like, it's, it's uh, the way most people phrase it is Shintoism is for like happy times and celebrations and festivals. And Buddhism is for death. And yeah, that's kind of it. In, in the practical everyday life, it's like what, funerals. What can you, Buddh Buddhism is for death. Yeah, it's like, it's like where you go like for funeral rites and burials. That's uh -huh. Buddhism for celebrations, <laughs> birth, happy times, getting really drunk and wasted. That's Shintoism. It's it, Shintoism's great. It's really it's kind of like this. You think of animism, right? The, the old idea that spirits are in everything. You could even say there's spirits in this computer, and there's spirits. You know, there's there's life in everything, even what we think as in, inanimate objects. And so, sort of Shintoism is just like kind of an animistic religion so there's sort of like a respect for nature and automatically they are uh, more connected to the nature that's what mm -hmm. i wanted to say right yeah yeah we are kind of cut off here <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> yeah shintoism's it, it's it's really fun because it, it is esoteric and it's not super well defined there's like the kojiki and stuff but yeah but that, that'd be another topic talking about shintoism or how shinto buddhism <laughs> Buddhism yeah. specifically in Japan was like, so in China, so like the history of Buddhism, uh, so it started, Buddhism started in India with like Siddhartha or, you know, that, that one guy, the Buddha, people call him the Buddha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they have other names for him too, but um, so that was India. So he kind of started that uh, kind of a branch from Hinduism a bit. So it's similar, <laughs> but different. And basically for those who don't know the basics of Buddhism, so like the first, there's a few basic principles. Basically the main one, I think it's the first one. I might get the order wrong, but all, most, some English translations say all is suffering or all life is suffering. That's kind of a bad translation in some ways. And the book I've been reading on Zen clarifies this is all life is dukkha, which dukkha means it's a better translation of it is disappointment because dukkha encapsulates both pleasure and pain. So it's not that all life is suffering because people think suffering and like that's negative, you know, that's pain, but it also includes uh, pleasure. Pleasure uh. is also a part of dukkha because it's also disappointing because it will end. So the attachment attachment is where suffering, all dukkha, disappointment originates from. And that's the second principle uh, is that we are all trapped in, you could call it suffering as long as it has this nuance that suffering includes pleasure and pain in this greater context of, well, you know, you have a really good time and, but that good time is going to end. So if you're gripping onto it and you're like, I don't want this to end, then you're going to feel disappointment. So like the third part of Buddhism is, well, how do you get beyond dukkha, disappointment, suffering? And that's, I think it's like the eightfold path. And then basically it goes into the Buddhist idea of, well, different Buddhist branches or sects believe and say different things. Certain things say, you know, there's certain things you should read, you know, take on a practice of aestheticism, you know, all this blah, 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 blah. And, and yeah. some, 
some things are more layman oriented, you know, for everyday people. And that's mainly the sorts of Buddhism that I've been getting into because, you know, at least for right now, I'm not a Buddhist priest. So <laughs> I'm still like, uh, did you, did, did you enter any, any, uh, uh, Ash, not uh, Ash temples or something like that? Did you have any contact with, uh, real life monks or something? Did you have any real life teaching from when you're there? Uh, not so far in Japan. Uh, I will say before coming to Japan, I read a lot of this uh, website by this guy called David Chapman. He's a part of the Aero Tagare. It's, it's a Tibetan Buddhist branch. I think it's the only, I think, legitimate Tibetan Buddhist branch that is based in, is either America or somewhere in Europe or the West. So it's the only, or at least maybe the only legitimate Western Tibetan Buddhist branch. So it's called the Aero Tagare Buddhist. He wrote this website. He has a few. The one, it's meaningness.com. That website, he wrote it all in a secular um, perspective. So he doesn't use any Buddhist religious terminology or spiritual terminology. And th- I really read a lot of that because he, he gives a lot of good clarification on basically ways to untangle yourself from ego and attachment and from, in a lot of ways, an intellectual perspective. So for people who are skeptical or are coming from this Western perspective, I think he's a really good entry point because he is talking the language of the West. I mean, he's a Westerner himself. So you're not entering into it, reading this like really esoteric Zen stuff. You're like, what is this? You know, he takes, yeah. this, he takes a top, he takes a intellectual approach and sometimes gets esoteric, but always has this sort of intellectual focus or background, which I think is really useful for introducing people to Buddhist ideas and, perspectives and he has another website called approaching arrow.com i think and that is he he just that's like the flip side of the of meaningness where it's just he's using buddhist terminology and specific terminology and stuff to get a more specifically buddhist uh, perspective but that's probably the only like i guess teacher so i actually haven't had like a person in japan um I mean, you know, Jordan Bates, I did one-on-one coaching with him. So I guess if he counts as a teacher, <laughs> but, but <laughs> no, no, but I was thinking like a uh, true monk when you're, it's a good chance to go learn uh, Zen, Zazen mm. from someone live. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I want to get smacked by a stick. I mean, <laughs> maybe, yeah. Maybe you get enlightenment, enlightened. Uh, oh. so, yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, two questions now. Yeah. Uh, do you think it's uh, like common that people who Westerns, Westerners who practice Zen or read or try to practice, I don't know, uh, it's easy for them to slip into nihilism? Oh, n- it, nihilism? I, I have like a, I, I have like a experience for my own. It's like it's it's easy to slip. Like if you have a wrong idea, to go, it's like maybe from our Western mind, it's uh, similar. Yeah, it's, have- it's 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 interesting. Yeah, because that that topic, there's sort of like for me, there's like the two things. There's like hedonism and then n- nihilism, like to like just the pursuit of pleasure and sort of like the belief or perspective that not like nihilism nothing matters or whatever and it's interesting because i feel like the zen or buddhist perspective kind of it's kind of like a gateway to embracing kind of like every perspective in a sense so yeah there's been times where like i'd say after i had like an ego loss moment or something where yeah there was a radical release from expectation and for many weeks or like months i just like did nothing but like hedonism and then I got bored of that. And then I like had productive energy and then I started doing stuff. And so, cause like when you talk about nihilism, are you talking about like, like people they, living they, it out? Like, Oh, nothing matters. And then defaulting into like this hedonistic, like kind of like they're not doing no, anything. It's, uh, did or... you, did you, did you watch uh, Rick and Morty? Oh yeah. 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 Uh, so <laughs> it's I, I love that uh, cartoon. Yeah, it's awesome. It's, uh, it's and I I I I listened to the creator of the cartoons. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a couple of minute video, mm-hmm. and he says that uh, by nihilism is like nothing matters, nothing really mm-hmm. matters, something like that. 
uh, but when you realize that nothing matters <laughs> at that point everything matters so it's oh, like yeah. you you melt in that uh nothing matters yeah. everything matters yeah stuff that's, so that's it's actually, pretty, that's actually, it's that's pretty similar zen. that's very yeah zen, it's yeah. very zen that's, that's why i asked yeah. because in my experience it is yeah because i will say because there's like two forms of nihilism if you're going to maybe categorize it there's the nihilism that is ego centered and that's okay. like nothing matters and then you're justifying like doing like I'm going to eat a lot of unhealthy food. I'm going to play video games and like masturbate 3,000 uh -huh, times a day. You, like, you slip into hedonism. Yeah, hedonism. So that's why I usually talk about them together. But then yeah, there's yeah. like the Zen and like this other kind of nihilism where it is this, it's like what Nietzsche talked about. It's this, you, you really, it's the child stage. So if we were going to get into that, but it's the, you release expectation, you let go of the ego. And technically that's nihilistic in some sense because there's an acceptance that, yeah, nothing really matters in a linguistic game or at least we can't know or whatever. But in that acceptance or letting go or, or you know, nothing, you know, resist, resisting of nothing, then, yeah. So I would argue that everything. maybe they're not so part. I would argue maybe that this one is a step forward. If you, like, uh, allow yourself to to understand it like maybe even uh, uh, mathematically or some if mm. nothing matters then really everything matters it's it's uh, mm. some logic or something it's well it's, it's like a it's a paradox though because you're saying nothing matters and everything matters simultaneously yeah. but that that is it it's because yeah. if you're trying to intellectualize it maybe you could say you let go of the ego trying to grip onto things trying to say, oh, but I got, I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to buy this, I got to make these people happy, I got to blah, 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 blah. You let that go, and then when you let it go, the things that just will flow and will get done will just get done, and the things that don't get done just don't get done. And, <laughs> you know, like, there's, there's more power and energy there because maybe right now, like, people listening to this, watching this, are putting energy into things that really don't matter and if they let go of their ego, the energy they have within them and around them in their environment could just plow through things that maybe not should be done per se, because that gets into like the should and morality and stuff, but could be done, could be done. And uh, a lot of people, like myself included, like when I was making like the first two YouTube videos I made, felt very natural, were very fun. And then like two or three videos I made after that were kind of forced, kind of like this, Oh, I should be putting out a video every week. And so it's just yeah. the ideas weren't there, like like whatever. And so it's just garbage, right? And so once you release from that, then it's like, oh, this weekend, I literally want to do nothing but just play video games for 48 hours straight. And then I do it. And then I, and then the next weekend, oh, I want to do nothing but write articles and do videos for 48 hours straight. It's like if you're in a position in your life where you can do that, then dude like don't yeah, allow yourself, yourself don't beat, yeah do don't beat yourself up like that's what i used to do and then you are less productive ironically because you're trying to micromanage control everything but when you let go like right now we're having this conversation and earlier today like i did a bike ride and then like did a bunch of productive stuff that just like really flowed like i wasn't forcing it i wasn't expecting it it, it just happened <laughs> you know <It's> like, <laughs> that's when you get stuff done that's the, that's the power you're like riding the wave rather than trying to fight against it so can you shortly uh, lead us through the the, true st the three stages you mentioned before? Oh, uh, oh yeah. Or... So basically, Frederick Nietzsche, he was a 19th century, 1900s to, yeah, 1800, 1900s uh, philosopher. And he has this idea. Uh, I'm reading this book now called uh, Zen, Nietzsche and Zen. Uh, what was it? By this one guy. <laughs> I have the book under there, but it's covered. <laughs> but, <laughs> It's like Bond something. Anyways, interesting book. I'm not done with it yet, but basically there's similarities between Zen and Nietzsche. And uh, one idea Nietzsche had was there's like these three stages that people often go through. There's the, <laughs> I always forgot, camel, lion, and child stage. So the camel stage is like the religious initiate, the person who says, oh, there are clearly bad things, good things, or there are clearly good and bad things, clearly good and evil things, righteous things, uh, you know, evil things, you get the idea. And so they think, okay, I have to find out what's true. I have to find truth. 
uh, moral righteousness so that I can become good, so that I can, you know, all these things. So they take on these moral burdens of like avoid evil. So some religions or things might say, you know, avoid premarital sex, don't drink alcohol. Like the rules. Rules, yeah. So you take on all these moral burdens and like it's really hard. It's difficult. I've done it. It's really, really tough. And then at some point, this won't necessarily happen, but the next stage from the camel stage is the lion stage. And, and so, so basically in the camel stage, there's what Nietzsche calls the will to knowledge. Or, or no, not will to knowledge, will to truth. This is the I will find truth. And it's, 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 a, it's the powerful thing of like, I will find the truth. And, it, it, you know, because it's good, it'll, it'll, all this stuff. But then from camel to lion stage, this will to truth is dropped. And there's this perspective of, oh, like either truth doesn't really exist to begin with, or even if it does, we can't really know it. So there's like that acceptance. And there's a shift from will the truth to will the power. And there's this idea of, well, we can't know if there's truth, but there's certainly, you know, there's power. And, and then there's this shift to um, doing in the world. There's less of this uh, like moral burdening and things can happen I guess more easily there's more there's more power behind what you do and so that's that stage you know there's a stage of where there's this greater perspectivism <clears throat> there's not just a right and a wrong um there's a greater understanding and nuance to the world and so but then from shift from lion to child the last stage is this this letting go of the will to power and the letting go of the ego and getting this this radical transformation of perspective where it's not for example, the lion might be like, I used to be a camel. I used to want to know truth. There's this emphasis on I, 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 I. But once you get to the child, there's no I anymore. There's just, you're just looking at the tree and it's looking at you. And, and that, that's all it is. <laughs> yeah, uh, if you're going to say it in words. So that's a child stage uh, where they're like, like if you look at a child or a baby, do they're just running? You think they're like, I am looking at a tree. I am hungry. No, they're just hungry or they're looking at a tree. Like they're not thinking that <laughs> we, we, we teach them that we teach them the language, but like, in, like, like the child, especially the young child, like a baby or like a toddler, they're just like, yeah, looking you, you in You know what I mean? Everything. And they're, they're like at all at everything. Yeah. And that's, that's when you're at that stage, like you're just drunk all the time. You're just like, Whoa, <laughs> yeah. so uh, this is maybe a good uh, point to go to uh, to touch upon this enlightenment uh, mm. so i was thinking is it uh, i always thought like i i, I did uh, i never in my pursuit of uh, no actually uh, what uh, got me into all this stuff mostly was uh, the the for the laws of buddha that says mm. that life is suffering or oh yeah whatever, yeah, yeah. yeah those are that. cool yeah. So mine is uh, mine was this mine my mot mot motive for my drive let's say for uh, mm -hmm. meditating and exploring was that to just relieve the, uh, suffering to, yeah. to 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 live a painless life let's mm. say a life of ease but uh, I never really thought like I want to reach enlightenment and I did uh, uh, well talk to and read obviously and been in communities at least in internet or whatever mm -hmm. that uh, I, I saw what you read what you wrote in the article that mm -hmm. lots of people chase that uh, enlightenment oh. so yeah it's one of the it's one it, of the it best wasn't the, yeah <laughs> yeah but, but i never had like that so is, okay. is it like uh, what was your drive did you also oh. like oh let's see how we can oh. get to no, Let's no. see how we can reach the enlightenment. <laughs> I, I had a lot of I had a lot of ego constructs, and that's why over the past few months, and this article video was like the <laughs> it was like the <laughs> the manifesto. I don't know. Um, yeah, a lot of my life, I had this idea that uh, I wanted to find truth. Just like there was there was on one end just a desire. Oh, I want to know truth because it's cool. It's cool to be in the know to know to know what things are. But also there's a sense that truth would lead to like betterment. So there's this idea that if we know what's true, we can solve these conflicts, we can, we can improve the world, I can improve myself. Um, so there was that basis. Uh, but yeah, similar to what your motive was of like reducing suffering. Yeah, there was also that drive within myself. So yeah, there was, I guess the desire for enlightenment because the thought was at the time, 
in my past that if I get enlightenment, well, that's kind of what truth is. So then I'll understand truth once I get enlightenment. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get it. Um, <laughs> but it's funny, one of the Zen, I think it's Dogen said that um, enlightenment is a, is, a, is, a, is a hitch for donkeys or is like a, is for donkeys and camels. And so it's funny, like like with with Nietzsche's comments, because because it, it literally is for camels. Like if if you're in the camel stage, where there is a right and there is a wrong, and you're stuck there. Um, but <laughs> so is that like a like a Western uh, made up word, or do they actually the Zen masters and uh, do they actually talk about enlightenment, or do just uh, uh, because there, it, it seems yeah. like it's more like a it product. It sounds like a something like we could uh, mm. coin up yeah because i think in in zen they they have the the idea satori right it's the poo yeah. it's the instant in english you translate maybe as instant enlightenment or whatever you want to say but it's it's like the moment of seeing it's like when i was driving my car <laughs> so a few months ago <laughs> i was driving my car and you know there's like the angry angry I'm an angry driver. <laughs> There's the Sunday driver who's driving 10 kilometers slower than the speed limit in front of me. And I go like 10 <laughs> over always. So like, ah, and then like my ego was just, whoo, it was just, it was just, uh, yeah, it, it wasn't there, I guess for like five seconds. And then, <laughs> so it was just like the awareness of the car in front of me, driving the cars, the, the sights, the sounds, everything. And, but there wasn't a sense of me like, oh, it's my car I'm driving. There, so there's this big space. So even like the anger and the sense of self, like, oh, I'm angry that this person's driving slower. I want to drive faster. Those were also just like, you know, like trees you see outside. It's just like, there's like a space. But, but driving is a, is a, is a good uh, example. It's a good uh, place to practice because <laughs> you always wanted to reach some, some place and someone else is uh, not letting you do it and uh, oh, yeah. someone else's fault it's an uh, angry place yeah. <laughs> it can yeah, be yeah yeah very yeah very anger thing but i will say it wasn't like i was like oh man i'm gonna meditate i'm gonna get rid of my anger i'm gonna become enlightened uh -huh. it just happened it was just like bam it was just like <laughs> you know it's like it wasn't planned uh and i think that's what like in the zen they'd call satori you know it's just yeah. like it's like if someone shoots you with the gun or like stabs you or like like the other day, a spider dropped on my arm. I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like those moments where you're just, you're really awake. Um, yeah. <laughs> no denying it. And then it's just like, in that moment, there can be like a whoo, where there's just like a space where like, there's no ego. There's just, there's just everything all, all going on. And uh, so in, in some sense from that, in similar experiences, there's this one Zen master who, this one Zen student was like, oh, master, master how do I reach enlightenment? Come on, I've done all these things. I've done everything you've asked. I've, I've fasted. I've given up everything I own. I've meditated for years and years and years. <laughs> the master was getting really angry with him at this point because he just, he just didn't get it. So he takes his sand off and just smacks him. He just smacks him right in the face. And then he didn't have to, he didn't have to ask any questions anymore because he understood. <laughs> so, so that's, one example, and then so in Zen, there's like the satori, just the instant. You could say enlightenment, but uh, I don't know if we were talking about how enlightenment is maybe a Western idea or more Western, where it's sort of like if maybe if we were to try to define enlightenment, you could say in Buddhism, maybe it's Tibetan Buddhism. There's or Tibetan. There's this uh, concept called rigpa, R-I-G-P-A, which is defined roughly as like the continuing non-dual state of awareness so this is the i guess you could say non-ego state but also ego state there's really no distinction distinction so trying to talk about it gets into weird paradoxes where you say it is the empty state and the full state it is the emptiest state the fullest state because you can't really describe it because you can't describe everything because language is inherently separated so it's just the paradox you get in that but um yeah, and then in my own experience, uh, in the past, uh, I, I maybe got too over intellectual and attached to these concepts where then the goal becomes, oh, I'm trying to obtain Rigpa. I'm gonna meditate so that I can get the non-dual state, so that I can get rid of ego. But if you think about the, you know, the, the catch-22 
is if the ego is getting rid of the ego, who's getting rid of the ego? And then it just hurdles all the way down because um, in the end, nothing is going to get rid of the ego because well, it doesn't really exist. And uh, <laughs> there's nothing to get rid of. Uh, I mean, it does exist, and <laughs> but it doesn't. <laughs> you <don't> get it. <laughs> yeah. But I had, uh, like in the last uh, couple of weeks, I had uh, two similar experiences, uh, like you could describe them as Satori. Mm -hmm. uh, I was... And and it was uh, interesting. You you mentioned about the camel phase and stuff mm -hmm. like that because I I never, I I didn't get into theory much. So I, I'm not mm -hmm. sure where I am, uh, like in perspective in which which, uh, <laughs> but I just I don't know do it. And uh, I was I was <laughs> I was like in one part uh, one period of life like a month ago or something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was, I don't know, you do it all the time. You you try to impose some kind of rules to do mm -hmm. to some kind of habits to lead a good life or better mm -hmm. life to, to whatever. And yeah. uh, I was uh, like keeping up with, uh, I don't know, uh, taking regular walks, uh, dogs for a walk, uh, mm -hmm. eating something, blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, I realized uh, I was going to a walk with my mm. dogs and I was like, yeah, this is good. I'm going for a walk and I'm doing it <laughs> regularly. So this yeah. is good for my life. So now this yeah. is good. And yeah. I was like, and I just, <laughs> uh, and this is for me is like, I just kind of, I remember like stepping on a stone mm -hmm. and just melting in uh, the present moment, like, uh, if I cannot enjoy my every other every uh, step, mm -hmm. what uh, I'm always just doing things because uh, uh, I'm trying to imitate something that I heard that is good for me, and it's not yeah. like being present. And at that point, I just like it's like a like a puddle of uh, existence, just. Uh, uh, I think it's similar, like you said, just being aware of uh, of everything and just mm. doing it uh, for the sake of doing it, or not just for that, just just being. Yeah. Mm. So maybe yeah, the yeah. the main difference <laughs> between this is for going from doing to being. Mm, yeah. That was. Yeah. That's also a good description now that yeah. I think about it. Yeah. And if you take like the camel, um, lion, child, if you wanted to say it in this sense, it's like thinking, doing being those are like the three stages so like yeah, the, nice. the camel's the guy who's always trying to like oh is that good or is that bad <laughs> and then the lion's the guy who's like Ugh! and he just does it and then the, the child's the one who's like does or thinks or whatever you know <laughs> yeah well, it's I, not, I, I, guess, I guess it, it's beyond it but it's not because I don't know. No, it's because I have a I have a daughter that is not year yet five, and mm -hmm. uh, I had a similar <laughs> word teaching from her. And at one point, I uh, I realized uh, she was like four, and mm -hmm. she was everything. She she I got her from kindergarten. She just mm -hmm. says, oh, "Give me a paper." She starts drawing, mm -hmm. and uh, she in a couple of weeks she she got really good, mm -hmm. but she but then I understood she she didn't do it because she she knew she's going to get better. She just uh, did it because she liked to express yes. uh, her feelings uh, in the form of a drawing. Mm. And uh, in the meantime, she got better. So yeah. then I understood you, 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 you don't have to plan. You just have to yeah. do and the result would get, will be there by, it, by mm. its own. And it's, uh, for me, it's all about uh, releasing that control mm. because we have this... Mm. Uh, and I recently even watched Charles Eisenstein talk about it. Mm. We got this culture of uh, pure control. And we oh, yeah. got like exponentially <laughs> just going, uh, thinking that we have, uh, can control mm. everything. Mm. Just uh, we, uh, we, we go yeah. to, uh, to a state where we really control everything. Yeah. And then it's going to be good. Yeah. We, I yep. think this yeah. is like uh, ingrained in our mind that uh, mm. we don't, still don't control everything. We have to do it. And it's uh, this... Uh, I don't know. In yeah. that way, we are also separated from the from the nature, mm. and uh, it's uh, opposite from this mm. Eastern culture in every way possible. Mm. Yeah, I mean, in terms of planning, 
like plans can arise spontaneously or like what I do oftentimes, usually more so during the weekdays, weekends, I just kind of let them go like, whoa, they just, they just happen. I, and then after the day ends, I'll type kind of what happened roughly. I'll be like, yeah, I did this, this, this. But during the weekdays, I'll have a maybe more structured approach, partially just because I work and I have certain hours I work. So it's just there's a more structured like layout for my weekdays. Uh, but for in general, whether it's at work or in my personal life after work or before work, plans can change. And if something's like, oh, I feel like this productive energy for this and I know I can do a lot of work here, then even if I planned yesterday to do one thing, I might not do it at all that day and do it tomorrow or whenever there's a time. Of course, if there's like a deadline, then yeah, you got to like you feel it out. But for a lot of the things, at least that I'm doing, there's not a strict deadline or the deadline is so far out that it's like there's this ability to maximize what am I feeling? You know, what is the most energy right now? So I feel like a lot of people neglect and they beat themselves up and destroy themselves. And I did it a lot. And it's just really counterproductive because you'll people will beat themselves up or I would beat myself up for not doing things or like, oh, I'm not making a new article every week or even every month. I mean, this the, the most recent Life Further post was like the first post since late January. So what, it's been like three months. Uh, and I've written actually a lot of drafts, but there was just no energy or motive or it didn't seem right to post the drafts I posted or like there's sort of like just this letting go where it's almost like I guess like falling in love or something it's like when you know like you'll just kind of know and then you'll just you just kind of do it and there's not this cerebral <laughs> level yeah but you know <laughs> it, it it's like that you're afraid of letting go because you think mm -hmm. you have to push it in order in order to, for it to happen yeah in order to happen but that's the, that's the funny thing is when you start to let go, you start to realize the things you think should happen are just predicated in maybe different fear, or anger, ego holds. And so when you start to let go, the things that were just predicated in fear just kind of maybe start to go away a bit too. So then the things you're doing get more aligned anyways, and then you become more effective because then what you're doing is what you like doing is what you're good at doing. And then you just do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's like, uh, well, I got this from many angles, but uh, in my experience is that uh, the stuff that are, as you said, aligned with you and the stuff that you really want to do, it's, uh, they're kind of quiet if you're mm -hmm. loud and uh, uh, they don't want to like uh, scream, hey, I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> you just uh, see them <laughs> among the, everything else and yeah, it's yeah, all yeah. just a clatter. Then uh, <laughs> when you do get quiet and we just observe, it's like the uh, important things start to pop up. Yeah, they, they pop and, out. And, and There's no question. Yeah, and it's yeah. like uh, you, 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 and they, then you start to, I don't know, start to get comfortable with that intuition part of you that is mm -hmm. like, uh, I don't know, listening to your uh, inner being say, uh, saying uh, like, this is good for you. And then just you go for it. But my, uh, let's say, I, I saw your article, mm -hmm. and because I, 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 uh, I, uh, I published this first podcast, and I was thinking mm -hmm. when I'm going to do the second one, and then it's easy to slip into this uh, obsessive uh, thinking oh, yeah. and for sure. Uh, and oh, planning. I should do this and uh, yeah. uh, routine. Got it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and then I just saw your article, and then I saw, oh, I like this team. I have. Hmm. then it comes easy yeah, I, just, I do not have to think boom. what will yeah. we talk about for just, an hour it just pops up yeah. it's just there it's yeah, there. yeah 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 whoa i can talk three hours about this so yeah. and then you just do it and you then and, and even uh, yesterday i woke up anxious because uh, we didn't have work and uh, <laughs> <laughs> what am i work, gonna so do I was ah! <laughs> how i'm going to do i started and you, you don't even realize like i was thinking uh, uh what are we going to talk about what yeah. uh, uh, how will we, it will go lots of ex mm -hmm. expectations and stuff like that mm. and I, was, I was like well <laughs> we're talking about zen and i was yeah. like what oh no <laughs> was, not zen, i don't know not anything again. about it <laughs> uh, yeah. so actually i had a a, a second moment uh, yes, uh, that day yesterday mm. uh, i don't know if it's uh, mo it's more well, it was like this. 
I was uh, outside when I, st when I noticed I started to have some unhealthy thoughts. I went outside just uh, to be in the outside a bit, uh, played with the dogs. Mm -hmm. And uh, later I was like, this is uh, pretty Zenish. I went uh, to, to wash this dishes, like, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm washing dishes. It's oh, awesome. yeah. <laughs> and I was Wax washing off? the dishes. Wax off. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, uh, I was washing dishes and just thinking about anything just doing your uh, this is maybe the camel part <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and uh, I was watching the dogs and uh, they were playing mm. and this uh, uh, it's uh, one wants to play the other doesn't want the one then the other one wants to play and I was starting to feel like uh, uh, the one that doesn't get the play from the other one, yeah. I was start. I started to feel bad for him. I, I started to feel sad, but like sincerely sad. Like, and I was like, and then after I was sad, I I saw that the dog is not sad, but he just waits for two seconds, and then they start to play, yeah. and I was just going emotionally up and down. I mean, it was like a minute, but. Uh, mm -hmm. And this, this was like a first, like on a psychological level, a revelation, like, oh, dude, you're like projecting your, you, 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 oh, you're yeah, seeing yeah. yourself in the dog. Yeah. <laughs> and that's like, that was like a psychological level. Mm. But then I realized that's more like a Satori stuff. Mm. Then I see, whoa, but you're <laughs> seeing yourself in everything. Yeah. Like uh, you're projecting your emotional stuff on everything, mm. like on uh, mm everything and it's, yeah. it's hard maybe to explain now mm -hmm. but it just started to yeah everything started to make sense like uh, you i start to like uh, feed uh, not feed energy not feed everything with my own energy just to see mm. everything uh, yeah. separate from you i don't know yeah. if uh, i i realize i do it a lot you you mm. project mm. But but everything also like projects on you. So the dog sees itself in relation to you, and everything is in relation to each other. So, I mean, you take like like I think Alan Watts does an example. How do you define up, down, left, right? If you just had like one rock in space and that was it, just one rock, then there's nothing. There's no orientation. So we are always orienting ourselves and projecting onto each other in this mutual play of games you could say so the dog sees itself in relation to you in relation to its environment as we see ourselves in relation to ourselves our environment other people um so yeah that's that's like this there's this less distinction more and more between what is the self and what is the other or outside self or and yeah it's really interesting <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one thing now that you uh, mentioned is uh, I I wanted to say so basically uh, when you speak about we we said we are going to try def to define enlightenment <laughs> and we are doing it now somehow but uh, in uh, defining our how we understanding uh, <laughs> this yeah. point of life uh, so I think also the major part uh, why it's so hard to understand it because uh, you, you realize how many things are defined by language. Mm. And it's uh, I, definitely, we can say that it is something that is not describable because it, it cannot be said in words. Because in the moment you use words, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it disappears. I don't know. For me, it's somehow this uh, just a puddle of existence without form or mm. words so it's not just words it's form like a uh, human being uh, mm. plant and stuff like that the the thing you said uh, but that's maybe the middle stage because you said <laughs> because you said like before zen mountains are just mountains rivers are rivers while uh, exploring zen uh, mountains are no longer mountains rivers are no longer mountains and after zen mountains are again uh, mountains and river rivers so it's yeah 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 you let go yeah and you <laughs> feel them like without uh, giving them a name they are still here i think the the part when you are losing the the definitions the mm. languages and this uh, linguistic part part 
it's uh, when they lose their identity, but then mm. oh, you get back and it's kind of everything just, well, exists. Mm. <laughs> yeah, everything exists. I, I think maybe it was Dogen and I was reading in, in the book uh, Zen and Nietzsche, or is it Nietzsche and Zen? Uh, I think it was Dogen or something actually took a skeptical stance to the idea that language could not capture enlightenment. And I think even that, pretty much anything could be a barrier or an ego foothold. So I could see how you could say, well, language can't describe it. But then you could also just say language can perfectly describe it, just so that you're not holding on to the idea that language can't describe it, because that itself is a foothold. So it's sort of the idea. And that's where this Zen parable is so great, because it gets to the idea that things are just things. And in some sense, when you have this space moment of like no ego, I guess, initially after you get back to your skin the ego and the ego is like whoa what the hell just happened then it's putting these words together of saying wow dude like dude the ego's false man nothing is what it seems everything is much deeper like we're all one man and yeah in some <laughs> sense maybe but that is like you're that's the ego foothold so it's the spiritual materialism but but that's the tricky thing is someone who is technically enlightened whatever that means could be saying the same things, could be doing the same things as someone who is technically not enlightened. So someone who who has this state of awareness or whatever you want to call it could be saying, yeah, everything's one or blah, blah, blah. And they have this awareness. But someone who doesn't have that awareness could be saying the exact same thing. So yeah, it's this weird state, but it also is weird in the sense that like there really is no difference between someone who's enlightened and not enlightened and someone who's awake and not awake. And it's really strange because, but, but yeah, it gets to that like paradox level. Um. <laughs> I mean, in a level of doing, it's not, uh, it's, they're not uh, different, but it, it's just a state of being. Mm. It's, a, I guess, a subjective mm. state. Yeah. So maybe this is a good point to, to finish with some uh, thoughts on how this idea can be useful for our our culture maybe mm -hmm. our some because this is more like an, an individual's uh, pursue for mm -hmm. <laughs> for uh, enlightenment but uh, mm -hmm. or for understanding but uh, then uh, how that how can that be maybe yeah used better in a I don't know. You mentioned uh, something about uh, law enforcement and stuff like that. How mm. can be, uh, maybe not just perfectly, but a little bit, mm. how can that be used? I don't know. Mm. In our world. Yeah. Yeah. So like whether, well, whether it's law enforcement or international politics or politicians or any government institution or business by having this greater capacity. So not saying you have to like go really deep into this, like, go all the way or whatever, become a monk I mean, I, I, or whatever. But it's like getting this greater space between the ego and cultivating, I guess, this sense of greater space maybe is a good way of saying it. I like saying it that way. Uh, is uh, you're just able to better react and take advantage of energy when it's there and not beat yourself up when it's not there. So for example, like when I, like today was, pretty productive like in terms of things like there's this this talk which is i think really productive really meaningful and really good and like early i did a bike ride and helping to like make some dirt bike paths on Iki island to help rejuvenate the local economy here and like promote the island and you know get awareness out there and that just kind of flowed and and uh another person who's like the the head of this project kind of has a lot of energy so it's sort of like letting his energy come to be my energy and just flowing with it because what can happen when people have ego blocks is like for example let's say someone's really positive and they, they have this like super energy of like getting things done and they're just they're they're doing it they're sailing the boat and what can happen is if you have a lot of ego blocks then you know skeptical thoughts arise like oh is this person genuine you know, do they have an ulterior motive? And you get, you get into this like little ego game. And instead of just jumping on the boat, just get on the boat. Then there's this like, should I jump on the boat? Is, is it safe? How are the way? No, just jump on the boat. Just like, 
<laughs> and it's like, so once the ego goes away uh, or gets diminished, there's less resistance to accepting productive or non-productive energy when it's there or not there. And there's a greater space between negative or positive emotions. So let's say you're feeling angry, like, like, like I think ever since that driving experience a few months ago, like I'm always laughing. Like whenever I, I like anger arises, like from slow Sunday drivers, slow drivers, I'm like, I just kind of laugh. There's like, there's like a funny aspect to it because I know that there's like, it's all a joke and the emotion is predicated on like this kind of illusion idea of an ego. And it's just, it's just, there's this space. So for most people in in any aspect of life, whether it's politics, police or whatever, or jobs, personal life relationships, there's this space where you can just be more freely and more openly and you can totally accept your emotions, but there's also a joy and you don't have to act those emotions out. You don't feel like you are those emotions. And so, yeah, like if an angry emotion, let's say normally would motivate you to like honk your horn or like just feel really angry and bitter, that could be directed, redirected into humor. You know, that's why a lot of humor is really funny and a lot of uh, comedy, yeah, humor is really funny. (laughs) But no, comedy is, um, it can direct a lot of negative emotion into such positive joy. You know, people have the darkest scenes of like, oh man, that guy just got blown up. And everyone's like, ha ha ha, you know, like like laughing (laughs) because you channeled these dark forces, you could say negative forces, and you re-channel them into positive energy. And the same thing can happen with positive energy. People can take positive things and, channel it through the ego into negative energy and I mean, whether that's a good or a bad thing you know what whatever i mean t- typically people would probably want to be more positive and stuff um but yeah that's that's my take on it. no but but it's it's good you mentioned it because uh, uh actually that was kind of my process process as well uh mm-hmm. some of the stuff uh, that i um well w- w- you get to a point where you don't, you are not able to admit to yourself that you are doing something wrong. Mm. I think it's hard to say no, no. It's it has to be the world. It's mm. not me. But then if you get this, like it's called like cosmic humor. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, I love that. I, I, yeah. I, one day I just uh, reached to a point <laughs> where I just started to laugh to uh, to my stuff because you you get tired of how much uh, how many times you repeat <laughs> that shit <laughs> after realizing it. And uh, you, you just keep repeating <laughs> it. You just uh, start to get angry on yourself. And then at one point, yeah. I stopped being angry. And I mm. just, uh, I, I, I'm angry. And I said, and I start to laugh. And it's so easy. Like, uh, yeah, mm. it's, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, mm. it's really easy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it gets uh, the whole game, like, mm. playful. And it's, yeah. 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 No, no, it's definitely really fun. And it's like, like in one sense, you could say like there's like in one version of it, you could say it's like the escapism version where it's like using laughter and these channeling methods to avoid the emotions. So the very same process of like embracing joy and this greater spaciousness could be the very same method, similar methods used to run away from emotions and run further into ego. And that's what the idea of spiritual materialism, the idea that anything spiritual, religious or these sort of you know, ways of expanding your perspective can be used to bolster the ego. Uh, so in that sense, yeah, it's it's almost strange because it's almost like a, there's not really a way to describe it. It's just like there's the understanding that it's sort of all, you know, there's space and it's all kind of, kind of a game in some sense or kind of made up or not real in some sense or another. And so there's a sort of joy and humor and creative spirit in that. But in a, so maybe, yeah, the understanding, I guess, is an important basis because, yeah, I guess a similar, the similar, I guess, external behavior of laughing, you know, channeling anger and stuff into laughter. In some cases, it could be people running away from embracing the anger and just accepting it as being there and using laughter as just a diversion to, to run away from it. I think I actually did that in the past. Which is which yeah. is why it's funny because now I feel like my laughter is more natural and it's not a running away; it's a embracing. But yeah, yeah, hey, it's, it's it's subtle differences. It's all not mm. like big changes. Is everything stay? That's why I guess everything mm. stays the same. But it's yeah, <laughs> everything is just a bit different. Yeah. Like yeah. you you turn the <laughs> angle of yeah. looking at things. 
everything's exactly the same, but everything's completely different. No, <laughs> 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 at the same time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but uh, it's with the thoughts and emotions. The good thing I use is like you are being the sky, and your thoughts and emotions are being the clouds. So mm. they are still there, but uh, you don't. Uh, you don't. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's a cool, you're not it. Cool you idea. don't uh, identify identify with it. Oh, yeah, so you're the something. you're the space. Oh, you're not the the things happening in the space. You're yeah. like the observational force. The, the observer. Concept. Observer, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so I think uh, we did a fairly good job. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it's a good we done time it. to stop. We the, solved it. We, we, <laughs> we solved it. Like we solved alignment. It's it's done. You're welcome. welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Yeah, dear Moana, <laughs> we're gonna get copyright strike. Oh, <laughs> nice! nice. <laughs> But it's a good cartoon. Yeah, that's good. Uh, I will. Uh, do you want to say uh, something in Japanese farewell or something? <laughs> oh well, I could be like the really dramatic. You know, you like the the samurai, right? So I could be like the 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 samurai goodbye. You know, because I've watched some old samurai movies. It's like, sarabada. You know, it's like a. Uh, Usually the, the the cliche goodbye is sayonara, you know, in uh -huh. Japanese. But people don't actually say that too much. They usually say like matane, like see you later, or like, um, like ja, like well then, okay, like like there's different things. Ja, ja. It's like a rest of our, uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. The <laughs> reggae is the reggae is actually pretty good on Iki Island. They have reggae interest in Iki and like the Kyushu area. It's pretty cool because I, I like. Do, uh, they have dreadlocks as well. Um, everyone I don't know do, doesn't have dreadlocks. They're just, they just like the music and some people make it. So maybe they're not uh, into the, the Rasta Rasta, the more just the reggae uh, music. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> neo Rasta. Uh, yeah. Neo, neo reggae. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the new. <laughs> uh, yeah, I will, I will stop oh. recording. Okay. Well, yeah, well, it yeah. was good. It was good talking with you, Marco. And uh, yeah, if you want to talk again, or if other people want to talk on Zen and everything in between, <laughs> feel yeah, free yeah. To, to reach out to either of us. I think in the description of either of our videos or podcasts, you'll find Marco and my channel. And uh, yeah, like, subscribe, or whatever, whatever you do or not do. <laughs> yeah, we're connecting America, Japan, and Croatia, so yeah, we have yeah. to use this yeah. internet. International connections here we go yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> anyways uh hope everyone's having a good day good week and uh see you yeah <laughs> bye bye <laughs> goodbye